Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome on board. My name is Molly Huang, Production Director of Leader Associates and the host of today's webinar, Inside One Gigawatt Solar Tender in Myanmar, Heat or Hype. Equally excited to, as you are, we have just got information that Myanmar will officially extend its bidding deadline from June the 18th this year to July the 17th, 2020, which would provide a totaling of two months for local and international players to prepare and bid on. So everyone, how's your projects ongoing? I'm just kidding. Um, before we get it started, I'd like to run a few slides to give a general picture of the Myanmar energy market and why we host this webinar. Myanmar is one of the most poorly electrified countries across Southeast Asia with an average electrification rate of around 42% only. The country's electricity consumption per capita also ranks among the lowest in the world at just 227 kilowatt hours, whereas the world's average per capita has already reached 3000 kilowatt hours. Being a nation blessed with abundant sunshine and the strong potential of economic growth. It is, of course, a great idea to bridge the country's electric supply gap with carbon-free options. However, building a business is not as easy as building a solar power plant, especially in developing countries like Myanmar, where a lot of preparatory work haven't been done sufficiently. The one gigawatt solar tender initiated by the MOEE on May the 18th has attracted vast interest among local and international stakeholders, apparently as you can see from our audience profile today. However, many remain struggling to get the necessary licenses and permits amid COVID-19, which prevent them from entering tender. In the context, the goal of this webinar is to provide you with a recommended entry strategy in line with the time adjustments. And introduce to you the resources that you can leverage in terms of finance, legal, and local partnership. Moreover, at the end of November, our flagship event, ASEAN Clean Energy Week, will also be taking place in Manila of the Philippines on November the 23rd to 25th, and will go through multiple ongoing and planning tender programs, not only in Myanmar, but also in the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And also for today's attendee, a further 10% discount will be given for your tickets using the code ACEW2020. Okay, um, no more sales pitch. Let's stick to today's presenters and agenda. Uh, with great honor, I'd like to introduce our three distinguished guests today. Mr. Peter Crowhurst, CEO of British Chamber of Commerce in Myanmar, Mr. Adwin Van der Bruggen, partner of BDB Loy, and Mr. KK Leung, CEO of Smart Group Companies, a reputed Myanmar local stakeholder. Firstly, Mr. Peter will give us a touch on the overall business landscape and the foreign investment climate in Myanmar, followed by Mr. Adwin's in-depth interpretation on the legal clause of tender. Mr. KK, as the third presenter of today, will further complement the tender pro the process with an extra focus on the land acquisition issues. Traditionally, each of the presenter will be given around 15 to 20 minutes for audience Q&A after their presentation. Uh, this time, however, considering the specialness of the market period, in addition to the traditional Q&A, we will also add one extra Q&A slot at the end of the webinar after all the presentations. So I would strongly recommend and encourage every audience to use the Q&A box and raise your questions whenever you can. After all, you are not able to grab another time uh, and piece all the opinions and ideas together. So, uh, all right, without further ado, I'd like to hand over the floor to Mr. Peter Prahost. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, ni hao, or sure, Peter. Uh, a, a, a very warm welcome to uh, Yangon and the British Chamber of Commerce here in, in Myanmar. Um, essentially, what I'll do today is just give you a very brief overview of where we are and the, in the various sectors of power in, in Myanmar. It's, uh, we can go into greater detail later on offline, but we'll save up most of the time for Q&A and where uh, entities such as the Chamber or Edwin and, and his team can support or KK, KK can also support. 
so I hope you can see you can see the uh, see the screen. Um, uh, so there's no shortage of plans, as I say, national energy plan, national electric electrification plan, uh, many plans. Um, we're trying to get some of them off the ground here if we can. Um, the target is to have power to all the people um, by 2030. We'll have to double the generation capacity at least. Uh, can the grid itself actually handle it? So therein lies another opportunity. Um, 2016, the master plan started with solar and wind at very low levels at about 1.2% of the of the uh, of the electrical share. Uh, that's been updated to around about 12% um, uh, by 2025. Uh, hence the current solar uh, um, bid coming up to one gigawatt. Fossil fuels obviously play a, a, a major role um, and is likely to be so for some time. Um, but you know, particularly uh, coal, coal and uh, some uh, oil. Renewables, hydro is renewable. Opposition and suspicion around mega projects are something that's to, to be taken into account. So our suggestion is probably looking at more smaller projects that have less impact on environment, less in, impact on um, on uh, general sort of uh, well-being and th you know of the local communities. Obviously, the replacement of diesel is something that we need to uh, uh, be targeting. A lot of the GSM towers dotted around the country, around about 17 to 18,000 of them, a high proportion of them are running on diesel. Um, a lot of this has been replaced by solar projects run by, for example, Yoma Micropower and many others that are um, hoping to sort of eliminate the need for uh, GSM, sorry, for, for diesel. Biomass. Uh, biomass is obviously a very attractive way and in some ways, but obviously in another way, it's actually having a large environmental impact, uh, particularly on deforestation. So the renewable options are obviously are clearly solar uh, and obviously areas such as tidal and, and wind. Moving to the next one. So 50%, this 50, 60% as, as Molly mentioned, are not, on the, not connected on the grid. Um, a large percentage is produced by hydro, but uh, the balance is coming from fossil fuels, coal, gas, oil, and, and so on. Um, despite this, Myanmar is, is still a next net exporter of energy, sending a lot of resources overseas. So gas comes out of the ground here and comes back in a bottle. So um, we, Myanmar itself also needs to uh, uh, move itself up the, uh, up, the, up the food chain, so to speak, into uh, uh, being able to develop its own energy products and sell its en energy products locally. A lot of happens on wind. Priority studies in, in, uh, in, since two, 2011 in the various states mentioned there. Um, wind power plants in, in uh, Changta, Magui region, all in the hills there and the beach resorts. A lot of seminars, much PowerPoint, lots of opportunities in the wind sector. Uh, and this morning I was on the call with uh, the Carbon Trust in, in the UK, um, and they are um, uh, very keen to be developing uh, the particular areas on wind power. Solar, which we're talking about today, solar plant, in, for example, in Mimbu, uh, producing about 170 megawatts, more planned in uh, Mandalay Division. Other plants developed by Yoma Mandalay, Yoma Micropower, all coming from the private sector. Tender, the tender release is, is, is good, it's, uh, it's about the right size. Tender conditions uh, and schedule are tight. Schedule extension, as you just heard, well, it's happening. So it's, um, you know, you've got an extra month. Other areas um, which, we, which we are working on, uh, generation of, uh, of, of tidal and river currents. Um, Generation is predictable and reliant. You can read the chart tables or the tide tables. You know when the river is flowing and not flowing. Um, we have plenty of rivers and plenty of ocean. We have 1500 miles of coastline. Um, however, at the current moment, limited to commercial floating tidal uh, energy devices are available. Um, we are actually supporting a uh, UK company in this area uh, who are bringing uh, UK technology into the country. Uh, there will be local local fabrication uh, here in uh, in Myanmar. So the chamber is supporting them with uh, uh, sales and also connectiv connectivity and linking investors to the project. 
So a lot of a lot of opportunities in the tidal sector. That's it really, uh, the chamber is here, we're ready to support and help any uh, member companies or non-member companies looking to come into the market. Um, we have an exceptionally active working group uh, led by uh, a participant today, Mr. Neil Carmichael. Um, uh, and we're improving the quality and volume of the foreign direct investment, uh, mini grid, off grid introductions. And we would also recommend uh, the private sector, uh, not just waiting for the, uh, uh, for the government tenders and bids. Uh, so please do visit us, to give us a call. Um, um, together with the participants today, we're more than happy to help advise and uh, put people in the right direction. Thank you very much. Uh, do, 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 do shoot some questions should you have time, but I'll stay on for the rest of the, rest of the, event, uh, of the event. Yes, thank you so much, Peter, uh, for your kind uh, preliminary preliminary introduction of the market. And also during the rehearsal, uh, me and Peter had a several conversation regarding uh, the audience Q&A, what kind of questions might be raised by the market participants. And uh, Peter mentioned that he will be very honest with all the people. Uh, so during the pre-registration, we have uh, selected several questions from the audience for Peter. And here are the top three that we'd like to introduce to you. Questions for Peter. First one, um, what are the challenges for achieving financial closure for the project in the given timeline? Any possible financing means for the project? Uh, yeah, like I say, there's a lot of uh, opportunity with working with either local banks or the international banking sector here in, uh, in uh, Myanmar. Um, and, and again, also working with sort of uh, commingled funds overseas or, or, or sovereign funds. Uh, there are, there are plenty of financial opportunities here. And I'm well aware that there is uh, uh, you know, a lot of money uh, available in the private equity sector that would be interested in participating in such of these, uh, such, mm -hmm. such. Yes, so uh, are there enough local um, capital available for the projects or most of the capital of most of the funding resources would be from international sphere? I think, yes, there is money in, in the market, but um, you know, I think it's being able to develop the right formula to be uh, at the moment. You know, banking lending rates are, are quite high. Um, so I think there has to be revert, you know, generally focusing towards the private sector to finance, to finance the, uh, the uh, programs. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't too reliant on, on government uh, to coming, to the, coming to the fore straight away. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andy, I, I read from your profile that you've been in the Myanmar for the past, uh, um, I, I, I believe it will be seven years, sure. since 2013. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your personal experience, what might be the biggest challenge for foreign investors to come into the country? Uh, stakeholders, map, mapping the stakeholders uh, of, the, uh, of where you want to do the business, mm -hmm. understanding very deeply the uh, mm -hmm. All, all the sort of cultural nuances, a little bit like entering China, you need to know your stakeholders. Here very mm -hmm. much, um, uh, you need to know your stakeholders. Uh, mm -hmm. We're working on a project now for a, for a non-related client. Um, that is, we are supporting very heavily on the stakeholder mapping, who mm -hmm. they should be talking to, how they should be talking to, when to talk to them, and, uh, and so on. So it's really the, the key is knowing your stakeholders and getting mm -hmm. support. So mm -hmm. people like KK, people like Edwin, who are on this call here, are all subject matter experts to be able to mm -hmm. get entry into, into, the, into the country. Mm -hmm. And what, what kind of support does the Myanmar expect from international players? For example, in terms of money, technology, or whatsoever? Everything, really. Um, you know, I think you know, Myanmar, it is at the sort of lower end of the scale of uh, of uh, technology, but don't and don't underestimate it. But on the other mm -hmm. side, of the equation, you know, there is the need for financial support. There is the need for technical expertise uh, in particular areas. But the Myanmar themselves mm -hmm. are good at, at, at catching on very fast. So mm -hmm. I think um, you know don't un don't underestimate anything. Um, mm -hmm. the, the will is there. Sometimes the money is not is is not there, but that's where you know money and a little bit of expertise and a little bit of management support will help get things across the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can kindly open the control panel, there is a Q and A box. And mm -hmm. also, 
in the open panel, there are several questions lining up. Uh, I think you can scroll down to the end and there mm -hmm. are three questions for you exactly. Uh, so the first one uh, coming from Mr. Mohammed Hasper, um, mm -hmm. he asked, is the COVID-19 pandemic causing any delays in the tendering process? Well, it's not helping, that's for sure. Um, people can't come here, the, it's essentially closed and getting a visa is very hard. Um, mm -hmm. Platforms such as this, technology such as this, um, uh, we're able to, to uh, provide support from, from Myanmar. We're mm -hmm. actually companies now, and I'm sure Edwin and uh, KK are doing the same, uh, be able to get hold of the, uh, the necessary tender documents uh, and actually will personally deliver them to Nepidor uh, on, on your behalf. So we're happy, we're happy to do that, um, to be able to support uh, a diverse and supportive um, tender. Mm -hmm. And what kind of incentives that are currently available uh, in Myanmar's power sector? Mm, I don't know. KK might be able to answer that. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, for, for what's worse, uh, thank you so much for a kind um, address and uh, uh, for introducing our next two presenters, Mr. Adwin and Mr. KK. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of questions uh, coming for the detail, the tender program, as well as the local players practice in terms of processing the tender. So I think it will be uh, Adwin and uh, KK's turn to introduce more of your perspectives. And thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. I know you, you need to jump for another call. Thank you. Yes, and uh, Mr. Edwin, uh, now it's your turn. Uh, may you be able to uh, turn up your microphone as well as switch the slides to your computer? Very quick, and I'm going to focus. Thank you very much, Peter, for, for this overview. I think that was very useful. Um, and you touched upon some of the points that uh, I think we can, we can build further. Um, so just very quickly, I, my job will be to go into the nitty gritty of the, uh, of the tender. Um, so the, the commercial terms and the, the RFP terms, um, and it, it's, uh, my job actually became more difficult. I, I should ask Molly for some extra, uh, so extra incentives because not only yesterday did they extend the deadline, uh, which, which, which was great news, but uh, they've also just released uh, a clarification number two uh, by the EPG on requests from, uh, from uh, bidders, uh, questions from bidders. And I've literally just, uh, uh, you know, gone, gone through as much as I could for this, uh, for this webinar. And I'll, I'll try to integrate most of what I saw. Uh, so this is not, not uh, you know, it's hardly public yet, it's, it's, it's just been released, um, but I will try to share some of what I saw on clarification too, as well during, uh, during my presentation. Um, so yeah, very quickly, this is our law firm, uh, Philippe Loy. Uh, so I've been living and working in Myanmar for eight years now. Uh, this is my ninth year. I've done a lot of power projects there, uh, including uh, Minbu, the solar project that uh, uh, that uh, Peter just talked about. As a matter of fact, uh, here you have a map of a lot of uh, recent and major projects in the country, uh, which includes uh, LNG projects, you have a lot of hydropower, you have uh, solar. Some of these projects have not been, have not been uh, completed yet. And these are the ones that uh, we worked on. Uh, so that's, that's, that's quite a lot, uh, it's quite a lot in the country. But uh, let, let's go forward to, first of all, uh, the, the, the where, the when, and the how of this uh, RFP. Um, so this would be a 20-year contract, uh, build on, operate, yeah, uh, one single PPA with, e with EPGE uh, per, per project. So there are, uh, 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 there are uh, uh, 30 locations that have been selected. You can, you can bid for one or more locations, you can bid for all locations if you like, but you need to submit one bid per uh, project, that is to say one bid per location. Yeah? Um, by the way, this is the, the, the PPA that you will sign with EBG is the only document that they are going to give you. 
there, uh, besides a letter of award, there's not going to be an implementation agreement or a concession agreement. There's not going to be a government guarantee. And uh, as Peter already said, land, uh, land is the responsibility of, of the bidders. We'll talk uh, more about that. And I think KK also has a very interesting contribution about that. Uh, later on. So where are these locations? They're all they're they're not all over the union, but they are they are spread out over uh, uh, seven uh, states and regions, uh, which is of course uh, in function of the uh, irradiation uh, resource. You see quite quite a number in Magwe, quite a number in in uh, Bago. These are the largest. Uh, the, they, these have the most sites. Um, so this is all. Most of this is central Myanmar and IOD is a little bit more southern. So here you see it actually uh, with all the locations and you see the which ones are 33 kV, which ones are supposed to be 66 uh, kV in terms of connection of the transmission line. And that is of course based on uh, the infrastructure, the T-line infrastructure that EPG already has there. Uh, so you see in Magwe, uh, you, have, you have six uh, sites in Sagain, you have four sites, etc. Etc. So this is central uh, Myanmar, if you like, and this is southern Myanmar, uh, uh, Ayawati, Bako, and, and Yangon, also one additional uh, site. Yeah, so that, that's what we're talking about. And, and uh, yeah, so this was the original um, bid schedule. On 18 May, this RFP went out, and we were supposed to uh, uh, complete these bids by the 18th of June. Yeah, um, a clarification has in the meantime also been uh, been sent out. Um, and this date has now been moved. Uh, we, we, we signaled that uh, yesterday to our clients. And today, indeed, the EPG uh, came out and confirmed officially that, uh, yes, 17 July would be the new submission date. Then we expect that also all the other all the other dates that you see in the schedule that they will all be moved as well with uh, 30 days. So you had uh, you have now you know another month and a half for the uh, for the submission uh, for the bid, and we'll, we'll talk about later what needs to go in there. Um, then uh, they, they have uh, uh, they don't have uh, they have about two weeks at EPGs to have, uh, according to the original schedule, they had about two weeks uh, to do the technical evaluation. Yeah, it is a, a classic two envelope uh, system. So EPG would first uh, determine which uh, bids uh, are, uh, uh, are acceptable according to their technical evaluation. And then for all those bids that are technically uh, uh, acceptable, they would open the second envelope of how much is the tariff, and that will basically be deter determining uh, the winner and the, and the runner-up. Um, so then uh, the RFP says that, well, uh, there is a draft PPA in that RFP, and it states that, well, we, we, should, actually, uh, we should actually agree uh, on this PPA in 15 days. Yeah? So that kind of assumes that this is a highly standardized uh, version. And people have asked me, okay, where does this PPA come from? And this PPA is kind of a hybrid, actually. It, is, it has some elements of the GEP, uh, the Minbu PPA, uh, the, the 170 megawatt, which is uh, the only one that's the only major one that's operational right now. But they've mixed in some elements of the V Power uh, PPA, uh, which is uh, uh, an LNG to power and a gas to power PPA, very recently negotiated. Uh, we also worked on that deal, so we can see easily how how they've made a mixture of of these uh, these. These, these different things. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite interesting. And it doesn't always work. It doesn't always match. There are certain things that don't, uh, that don't, really, um, uh, uh, that, that don't really match within the PPA. So um, also when you see in the clarifications now, APG is actually often saying, oh, this we're gonna negotiate. Yeah, this point we're gonna negotiate. Uh, we will discuss that in the negotiation, yeah? You, you see that you know 12 of, or, or 15 times in the clarification. So actually there's still quite a bit that needs to be negotiated in that uh, once you have been awarded. Huh? Um, so that is why they keep two winners. They have one winner and then one runner up in case there's some problem, they cannot close the PPA with the, um, 
with the winner, then they can go to the second winner, eh? to the, to the runner-up. That's the idea. But that timeline of doing this in 15 days, yeah, that uh, that's maybe uh, that that's maybe too ambitious. Eh? Um, then uh, then a letter of acceptance would be issued, um, and the original planning was would be bef somewhere before the second of August, which will uh, now become somewhere before uh, I suppose the second of September. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, before the 2nd of September. And that actually means then that you have six months to reach uh, operation. Then the construction should already start. Um, even though, yeah, the, the, the PPA will, will, will not be executed at that time yet. So let me share with you the timeline here that I made for you. Um, I'm not sure if it's really very visible, but do you see if we start here? Um, I, I actually don't know how to do a pointer, <laughs> but if you start with the letter of acceptance all the way at the left, yeah. Um, once you have that letter of acceptance, then actually you need to, you, you still need to, uh, uh, you, you supposed to have that PPA in a grid state within 15 days. Um, but even if you don't, um, you, you still need to uh, move forward with the construction uh, of the project uh, because you, uh, you see you have that, construction period of six months uh, until COD that is actually baked in. That is already provided in the RFP, right? Now, that six month period between letter of acceptance and the COD, that can be subject to uh, excusable delays, yeah? So you can have extensions of that. Actually, uh, in clarification number two, which was just sent out, um, you know, some, some bidders were asking, well, what is an excusable delay, you know? Uh, what, if you got, what if you are delayed with environmental approvals or if we cannot get our MIC permit quick enough? By the way, that's not going to be a problem. MIC is uh, super fast nowadays. Um, then how uh, uh, is that an excusable delay? Does that mean that we get more than six months? And because there is no definition of excusable delay, yeah? And EPG replied, well, there is a definition of that in the PPA, which you haven't signed yet, but apparently they're now saying in the RFP that the same definition for that you have in uh, for excusable delays in the PPA will, will be used, yeah? And that means, for example, uh, governmental force majeure will be, will be a part of that, yeah? Um, uh, a pandemic is also part of an excusable delay, uh, according to the PPA, which, which you haven't signed yet, but, um, but nevertheless. So what do you actually need to do in that six month period? Yeah. Uh, okay. okay, in that six month period, what you need to do is quite a bit. You have the land that you have set aside in your, in your bid. You will need to actually acquire that. That means you need to sign a lease agreement for it. Um, for most of the land, you're not allowed to sign a lease agreement until that land has been converted into something else. For example, farmland needs to be converted so that it's no longer farmland. Yeah? And only then you are allowed to sign a lease agreement. I mean, you can sign a lease agreement subject to conversion, of course, but then it's not effective. Yeah? Um, so that land has to be acquired and converted. Yeah? Uh, you need to get your MIC permit. That's not going to be a problem. MIC permit you can get even before you have a PPA, um, most likely. Yeah, we've done that also on other projects. Uh, you uh, you need to, and yeah, most importantly, you need to bring in your equipment. That's not a big problem, and you'll need to start building the power plant and the T line. Yeah? The transmission line is also part of your. Uh, of your requirement, right? So the, those are the things that you will need to do. Um, yeah, um, you know, land conversion, uh, it, how long does that take? I think maybe KK can say a few words about that uh, later on, but uh, you know, in some, in some examples it takes, it takes years rather than months, but in other cases it can go rather quickly. So it, it depends a little bit. Um, okay, so, um, uh, yeah, let's let's move on to all the different approvals that you are going to need. Um, our clients are asking that as well. So, okay, so if we go forward with this, so what what kind of licenses and approvals are we going to need? And the, the first stage here, project approval stage, you see that's the top level approval. Huh? That is uh, basically the cabinet approval for your 
for your project. And the reason why it takes so long, if you like, to get the PPA um, is uh, because that PPA needs to go up the chain. It needs to go uh, to uh, the cabinet, to the NEC. It needs to be viewed by all these departments that have uh, that, that weigh in on this. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, yeah, that, that takes a while in my experience. That, uh, that that can that can take a very long time. So that is why there is uh, that that long time lapse uh, between uh, getting the LOA and actually having an executed uh, uh, PPA. Now, after you have that, uh, you, you can actually start with the MIC before you have the PPA. Um, that will uh, that's the investment licensing stage yeah that will include uh, you know approval from the state and region Ministry of Commerce Central Bank of Myanmar uh, environment Ministry of Environment and Monrec they will all uh, have to give their approval as part of that phase and then you get your uh, after that you have your you know, the post MIC the permitting stage where you get the actual land conversion, where you get the actual environmental approval, yeah, or where you get your actual electricity permit. Well, still haven't seen many of those, but that's what you're supposed to get at least under the uh, environment uh, under the electricity law, and and that is then when the construction, uh, formally speaking, can can start. Yeah, so this all needs to happen in a rather uh, quick uh, situation. Uh, sequence okay um so um uh, i i think this is already well known we, we we discussed most of this you know as as peter said just to share with you right now in terms of in myanmar in terms of getting to myanmar and moving around yeah uh, so it's indeed uh, you know we are now doing land due diligence for our clients uh, that have already found land and from before and this and uh, yeah it's not so easy for us to get there yeah and we are already in Myanmar of course yeah um, because uh, yeah you, you may be your staff may be quarantined when they arrive at some township and that means they cannot do their job so even for us it is difficult uh, to get to Nepido is difficult to get to Bako yeah um, it's, it's difficult to get to Mandalay um, so, uh, and uh, yeah, and the, the bid submission still needs to be done physically in Napido with originals, yeah. Uh, so that probably means, uh, because there are no international flights to Myanmar uh, yet, and that will stay at least the case until 15th of June. Um, and after that, I also do not expect a lot of people coming in because there will be quarantine requirements there as well. So what probably is going to happen is that you need to uh, DHL or something, you need to DHL your package uh, uh, to, to somebody, uh, maybe to Peter, maybe to me, uh, maybe to your local partner and, 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 and ask them politely to get it to Nepido for you. Uh, otherwise, you cannot uh, do the submission. But that, that's one of the minor logistical uh, issues. Yeah. Um, so here are some, uh, not everybody can bid. You, there are requirements in terms of uh, your financial strength and there are requirements in terms of your experience in power generation. So you or your consortium partners yeah, uh, need to have individually need to have 20 million dollar uh, turnover uh, uh, at, at least, yeah, um, uh, over, on average for the last three years, yeah. So, and that is per uh, project, yeah. So, th this means that if you need to, uh, if you are bidding for three projects, then you need uh, 60 million uh, turnover on average for the last three. So if you want to, if you want to bid for all of them, it's almost impossible. Uh, uh, I don't know any energy company that has that much turnover. Yeah. Um, in the clarification just now, they also stated that, look, it's not enough that your group company has this turnover. No, no, it should be the bidder. It has to be the bidder. Yeah, not your group company, not your sister company in the Philippines or whatever. Yeah, whoever sends this piece of paper, that is the one that needs to have the turnover. Yeah, so you need to pick based on that. You'll need to pick the entity within your group that qualifies, 
And then if you get awarded, you will need to transfer that project essentially into a Myanmar subsidiary or a different SPV um, with their approval. Yeah, Th this is how we did it before as well. Uh, it should be it should be acceptable to EPG, but uh, you will you will you will have to ask them, and they will have to say yes. So what happens if they say no? Yeah. Um, experience is also a requirement. You need to have uh, you need to have at least projects, one of which in the last ten years, one of which involving uh, uh, solar technology. Uh, so that is in power generation. Yeah. So uh, the 20 million, that could be from building power plants, for example. It doesn't state exactly that it has to be from generation, yeah? Uh, maybe, maybe it's from selling petroleum, who knows, yeah? Um, but the experience in power generation projects, that is three projects over, over 10 years, yeah. Um, so if we go to the documents that you need to submit, um, and I'm trying to keep an eye on the time here. Uh, yeah, I, I cannot discuss uh, all of them. There's a bit performance bond of, uh, there's a bit bond of 500K yeah, per project. Yeah. Um, so I, I, can, I don't have the time to go over all of them, but I do, uh, and I will skip the land here. I will leave that to, to, to KK. Um, you also need to submit audited statements uh, for the consortium member for the last three years. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that also needs to be, like I said, a, a cumulative requirement. Yeah. Okay, so then you have done your, you've done your bid, yeah? And then the financial, uh, let's say that you technically qualify, you have the land, you have land titles, yeah? You have an MOU uh, signed for the land titles. Uh, and now you need to do, uh, uh, so now the, the determination will be on who has the lowest tariff. Yeah, the tariff is included, uh, inclusive of all taxes and that is fixed for the entire duration. And one of the, one of the big questions that we have is uh, if we go there, um, yeah, to the tariff here, we go to this slide, is okay, so what exactly are they guaranteeing to pay you, yeah? Um, and here, the, the PPA is uh, less than completely clear. Uh, my best take on it when I read it, because that part of it is basically the same as, uh, as another solar project that, that we have done with EPG, that basically means that they'll, they'll, you generate, they'll, they'll buy everything. Yeah, they'll buy everything. They will pay up and they will pay for up to 105% of the energy, yeah. So you, you generate, whatever you generate, they will purchase it, uh, and they will pay for it up to 105% of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of, of the, uh, the energy that they have estimated uh, in the beginning as when you set up the project, right? Um, that is what, what, how it looks like to me. Um, now, they muddied this water a bit um, because they used, you know, two different PPAs and mixed them up. And in clarification one, they said, well, we're, we're actually going to, the minimum should be 80% of annual generation. Yeah. Um, on, that was a reply to a question on, uh, that was a reply to a question on, on, uh, uh, on uh, take or pay. So I, I'm not sure what the idea is here. Um, I think this needs to come out in general. In, I think bidders would be, would be justified in saying, look, I assume that you're going to buy everything from me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and make a, a submission on that basis and then negotiate afterwards. Uh, it is clear that if you don't reach this 80% minimum threshold, then liquidated damages would be would apply to the generator. So then the company has to pay EPGE. Yeah. Um, so uh, so on, on 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 that basis, there's so uh, you know to to, uh, to 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 summarize I've, what it says now. To me, it means that they will buy everything. There's a take or pay on the entire delivered energy. The entire generated uh, energy, but uh, it is uh, there's some drafting issues in that in that PPA. Yeah, so that is of course very disturbing if you need to make a financial model eh? because you don't know exactly how much your top line is going to be. Yeah. Um, okay. 
I, I just wanted to say a few words quickly about the land. Uh, so um, you, you need to, uh, it is not enough to just identify the land. You need to submit land titles of the landowner, yeah? um, a farmland certificate, like a Form 7, for example, or the MAPS 105, 106. I think KK will, will, will say a lot about this later on. Um, I will just say that, look, you need to have the land titles of the landowner and you need to have something signed with the landowner, an MOU or a land lease agreement. And normally speaking, there will be an MOU. Yeah? So nobody really, very few parties have 100 to 150 acre lying around. Uh, if you talk to far farmers, mostly have like five acres, seven acre in those areas so th that's talking to a lot of farmers but there are of course aggr aggregators there are agents who, who go out and and who have already or who are now busy to 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 make conditional arrangements with with farmers to buy this for people yeah um and i, I should say uh we have in order to to try help the country so uh okay mindful of the time very quickly um in the ppa force majeure yeah what happens if uh, you cannot sell electricity to EPG because something went wrong? Then there are uh, uh, deemed energy payments, uh, so that they are provided for in the PPA. So that means they will pay you uh, for as if they have bought electricity from you, even though you were unable to generate because of some uh, force majeure. Uh, but they will not apply if the uh, if the company. Uh, if this is a force majeure affecting the company, yeah, they will only apply in case of uh, governmental force majeure, for example, or uh, force majeure affecting e EPGE. Then you will actually get payments during an FM uh, period, yeah. Um, others not. So the final thing, I guess, I have time to say for the um, um, on the PPA, which is important for bankability, is the termination payment. What happens in case uh, you've, you've built a whole plant and then EPG they change their mind, they terminate the contract or something like that. Um, so there is a formula here for a termination payment. They will pay you basically uh, five years, 60 months of, I, I guess, minimum guaranteed payments. They say capacity charge, but actually there is no capacity charge in the PPA. So this is just uh, you know uh, somewhere where the drafting of the PPA is, is, is simply not, not correct because they mix a lot of PPAs. Um, but I guess what they mean is that minimum guaranteed payments for five years, they will pay you, yeah. uh, but, they will, but they will only pay you if this is an EPG. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they will pay you half in case this is a, a government force majeure. Yeah, so yeah, this is something, yeah, lenders will normally uh, have some reservations about that. And no termination payment in, in case this is company force majeure or company default. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think maybe I should, I should leave it uh, here, uh, Molly, um, because, you know, uh, because of the, the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the rest we can uh, see a little bit on the slides. Uh, do you want me to go to the Q&A now? Yes, of course, that would be perfect. So we'll just quickly run through the pre-solicited questions um, for a general idea. And uh, I think there are probably around 20 to 25 questions lining up in the Q&A box. I would suggest that we have KK uh, present his points of view and then um, come back at the end of the session to address all the questions together. Would that be all right? Yeah, sure, sure. Whatever you say, you're in charge. We're in your hands. Yeah, so first of all, let's go through the uh, four questions uh, solicited by the pre-registrants. First one, uh, what preparatory work did the government of Myanmar perform on the proposed project site? For example, as a lot of people just mentioned, there was a tender, a similar tender last year, the emergency power tender. Yeah, actually, um, you know, EPG doesn't want to get involved with land and they did not with the emergency power tender of last year. They didn't do that either. And there we had to do land acquisition for our client as well. V-Power won all those tenders uh, and we, we, we helped them do land acquisition in, in all these sites. Um, and for, for this one, it's the same thing. So uh, EPG doesn't want to get involved in, in, the, in, in land problems and land questions. 
and expects the bidder to come up with that. So that's, that's uh, easy to answer. Um, so foreign companies cannot own any land in Myanmar. You can lease land, yeah. Uh, so you can lease it, or, uh, you know, this is a 20 year project, so you can lease land for 20 years. That is not, uh, that's not a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, basically, Edwin can help you to acquire the land and KK have the land. So <laughs> pass to the next question. Uh, the second question would be, what's the expected PPA tariff rate for the one gigawatt quota? Well, we see an aggressive bid on pricing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I think people need to understand about this uh, tender is that this is largely also a uh, integrating uh, projects that were already being prepared. Yeah, and uh, for projects that were already being prepared and that can be integrated in, in this tender and there have the benefit of being able to say, look, it was tendered and this one is the best one. Yeah, uh, that being said, it's, it's, still, it's still open and transparent because they're going to pick whoever is the cheapest. Yeah. Now, uh, who, uh, what kind of tariff are you going? Are we expecting? Um, it's a little bit hard to say, of course. But I think that uh, if you are a, a lot above six cents, I think probably no, no need to apply. Yeah. No need to, no need to bid. Yeah. Um, uh, it, somewhere between six and a half and 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 five, or maybe a little bit below five cents. Uh, I think that that uh, that becomes com competitive. You know, uh, EPG has looked also at the tender that was done in Cambodia, 60 megawatts uh, a year ago, won by a Thai company, um, and uh, that was a very competitive, uh, very competitive price. They often refer to that, um, but it's not really fair because in Cambodia they, they give you the land for free, and you don't need to go and find and, and fight for the land. Yeah, you, you, they give it to you. Uh, and uh, you don't have to you don't have to do the transmission and stuff like that. So I think we will we will be above that. But I'll, I would be surprised if we're going to be if we're reaching seven cents. Yeah. Um, so, but that's just a personal a personal idea. Yeah? Yes. And uh, speaking of the typical challenges in Myanmar's PV sector, also in this solar tender specifically, name the top three challenges you would say. Um, well, I think uh, the typical challenges, yeah. Look, one big problem is going to be that, uh, you know, is, is the, the, the wrong perception of the bidders. You guys are all thinking that this is a tender. It's not. This is a, this stage is a beauty parade. You just need to get in for now. You need to be number one or number two for that township. Because then you start negotiations, as you can see from the clarifications. This is how we do it in Myanmar. We get two or three people and we, we, get, we get rid of all the others. And then we play them out against each other to see who, who's, who's doing a little bit better than that. Oh, you, you want government guarantee? Oh, you know what? That other company didn't ask for that. Huh? Hmm, I don't know. If I were you, I would withdraw that. Yeah. So a lot of negotiation actually still needs to happen. And they, they, they say it in the, in the clarifications. They say, oh, we will discuss that. We will negotiate that in the PPA. How much is the take or pay? We will discuss in the PPA. Yeah. But you're only going to discuss with number one or number two, right? So this is not really a tender. This is a beauty parade to get the two best ones, the two, the two most competitive ones. And now we're going to do a direct negotiation in competition with those two. That, that, that's actually what it is. So all what you need to do now, you know, can forget, forget about how to, you know, how we're going to do the bid. No, 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 it's not about that. It's just about how are we going to get rid of all the other competitors? We want to be number one or number two for that township. They've already admitted in the clarification, oh, if we cannot agree on the PPA with you, you know, if you were number one, number two, and we cannot agree on the PPA with you, no problem, we give you your money back. Your 500K, it's okay, we give you back. So what do you want more, right? This, they are really, they, they are, they're, they're making it so easy for you to understand. Yeah, this is how we do tenders in Myanmar. Yeah, it's, it's actually a negotiation disguised as a, as a tender, and it works. It works. You look, go look at Chopio right now. You have the V power plant is there. It's there, right? Yeah. PPA not signed until much later in the in the process. Yeah. Uh, but it's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And uh, speaking of the question number three, uh, what are the challenges for achieving financial closure for the project in given timeline? Previously, it was just one month, nearly impossible. But for now, uh, now we have two months of, um, uh, of, of, of um, time. Uh, do you think it would be possible and through which means could we really you know, support the landing of projects? Uh, not if you if you think uh, based on traditional project finance, then then you cannot because you know just by having a PPA that that is going to be signed nearly when your construction is nearly finished, yeah, mm -hmm. that will that that is just uh, abhorrent to traditional project finance thinking. Right, so you need to think differently here. You need to either think about uh, EPC financing, where the lender finances the EPC provider, or the EPC provider self-finances, yeah, up to up to COD or maybe even uh, after COD to give some time. Um, it's either that, or you, you're going to have to think about the uh, a corporate finance scenario where you can refinance or divest uh, after COD. I, I, I think, I'm, look, I'm just a local lawyer. I'm not like a big financial, a financial specialist, mm -hmm. but I've seen a lot of these projects in Myanmar and these guys, they, they, they make a lot of money, you know? They, 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 can, they can pull it off. Uh, but if you think traditionally, uh, you know, project finance uh, oriented, like, okay, we're going to first get, you know, the PPA, and then when we have we register all the security, we're going to have, we're going to sign a facility agreement, blah, blah, blah. That, that, that is just, uh, that's not for this, uh, for, for these projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, since you mentioned EPC, because the least thing that EPC would like to uh, want to happen is the violation of contracts. So currently the, um, the, the construction days is limited to only 180 days. So would the, would the construction date be extended by reason of delay in the issuance of government permits? Uh, yeah, uh, difficult, to, diff difficult to manage, um, difficult to manage. But uh, you know, we're, if you don't look at just only one project, I think some EPC vendors are gonna look at this as a, almost a nationwide project. Not all of these projects are, are gonna get canceled, right? So if you move your panels in, and uh, you you and something happens with uh, with a site in in Magway, then you can move maybe your panels to another site. You know, uh, the, the, you should perhaps look at this as a as a general risk rather than a a, a, a project for project risk. So, um, but you know, one of the projects that that did make it was also EP, solar project was also EPC financed. Huh? That's that's how they got started. Uh, and and then uh, long term, you know, the senior lenders could take over. So I think maybe uh, for, for me that was impressive to see from you know from the inside how they were able to pull that off. And I think that matches a lot better with the with the requirements of this uh, of this uh, process here. Mm -hmm. Yes, well understood. Um, and uh, uh, and there's uh, a later part of the question: Is there any maximum limit of of takers? Uh, specify maximum limit of off takers. The, the off taker is EPG. Yeah, there's there's only one there's only one buyer huh? of uh, of grid connected. Yeah, the, the utility is EPG. So that's the Myanmar government. There's only one off taker. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, maybe if you say that, oh, can we can we also you know sell a few megawatt uh, to uh, to like an industrial zone that's going to be there or something yeah, yeah perhaps we've seen examples of that before but often EPG wants to wants to be part of that as well so I think just focus on on EPG being your your only off taker so you mean uh, it is possible for the uh, developers to do some CNI projects directly with the uh, corporate buyers industrial parks without use of the national According to the law, that's possible. Um, we haven't seen a lot of, uh, you know, we, we see this with a few uh, in industrial zones, but uh, we tried it. As far as I know, uh, hasn't been hasn't been completed yet because uh, hasn't 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 been finalized because EPG will say, 
Oh no no no, it's okay. We can do that. We can do that. Just sell it to us, and we will sell it to to the uh, to these uh, to the zone. Yeah, we will take care of it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, um, but according to the laws, yeah, that's possible. According to the laws, you you can now uh, if you get uh, an approval for it, you you can sell uh, directly to an industrial zone or or to uh, to a hospital or something like that. Yes, as also uh, as you mentioned, uh, EPC uh, as well. Um, so, does the Myanmar government have any preference toward the local EPC or international EPC? And how, yeah. how do you see the maturity of the overall supply chain in Myanmar? Well, uh, we don't make solar panels, yeah, so that's one thing, yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know that many companies in the energy uh, space in Myanmar that have $20 million turnover, yeah. They'll, maybe in oil and gas, there's a few. Um, so the, the requirements were not really set with, uh, I, I don't see evidence in this RFP of the Myanmar government trying to protect uh, its own businesses. Yeah, that's maybe good or maybe sad, depending on who you ask, but I, I don't, there's, for example, there's no local content requirements. There's no local shareholding requirements. In Myanmar, you can do a power project 100% foreign owned. Uh, so I, I don't see any protectionism there. Um, uh, of, of course, there's there's a lot of very valuable Myanmar companies that can help you uh, do this business. Yeah? Um, uh, but uh, just from a legal perspective, it's not required. Well understood. And uh, as you can see from the control panel, there are around the 30 to 40 questions lying here. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, I, I think that will require a certain time uh, and attention to read and process all this information. So may I suggest maybe we can invite Mr. KK to the stage and uh, uh, present his uh, slides. And after, after KK's presentation, we can have an overall view of the Myanmar market and how we can collaborate internationally and locally. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, from the list, I saw that there are about nearly uh, 300 people uh, attending the webinar. And uh, hello to everybody. Uh, Peter, thanks for your uh, presentation. And Edwin, thank you very much for your very comprehensive uh, you know, presentation. Well, I might be not take too long. Uh, I will be talking about, uh, according to the organizers, uh, I'll be talking about advantages and disadvantages for the locals, the local players. Actually, I'm very, very happy that this standard came out uh, because we've been waiting for uh, a long time that uh, Myanmar is going into the renewable energy. Unfortunately, the tender came out in the wrong time when the COVID was happening. So the tender came out. Another wrong thing is that the, the timing that we have to exercise to bid is also, it's only about 30 days. So now it's already, uh, extended to the another 30 days, which will become 60 days. Even though 60 days is, with this kind of thing, is not enough. And the way I look at it is that the, who float the tender is, they float the tender on the emotional basis. Because they have an emotional that they might not have enough power in the coming summer. But this is very important, the way I look at it, because it's the very first, this solar uh, energy tender, which is coming out as a tender. Because previously it's, it's not a tender, it is a direct negotiation. So it has to be correct. For me, as a local, we've been used to stay without electricity. So even though we don't have electricity in the next summer, or if we have a load shed, I'll be happy with that. But I want to do it right. I want to do this tender to be right and do it properly so that all the international tenders, all the international investors can come into the country with a very high transparency. Okay, let me start talking about the disadvantage of the locals. Just now, Edwin also say that the one who has to bid must have a three IBB project in last 10 years, and then one project with the PV technology. How can our local will have that kind of ability because there's only one PV project in the country. And how can the local investors will can have this kind of uh, requirement? That's why 
I put this small uh, picture there. Definitely the tender says that all the locals, you are out. We don't want you. That's the way I, I, I interpret it. Okay, 20 million US dollars for past three years. Well, that can be uh, happen, but unfortunately, just now Edwin says that. You see, like, under the smart, for example, I have different companies are there. If you combine it, if we combine it, it can be more than 20 million. But not a single company for the local to achieve turnover for 20 years or last exactly three years, not easy. So this is a disadvantage for the locals. And for me, I want, this is not a very big, uh, uh, technically difficult project. I have a strong belief that our local in technically build this kind of project. But unfortunately, with these kinds of restrictions, the locals cannot go into the tender. Another point is the lending rates for banks for locals are very high, very difficult for us to compete with the international investors. Anyway, I always look at the positive uh, attitude. Every disadvantage, there is always a corresponding advantage there. That's my belief. So what are the advantages for locals? Only local can own the land and the land acquisitions are very complicated in Myanmar. Let me show you a few things. The way I look at it, the way I look at the tender documents, even the one who issued these tender documents, I can say clearly that they don't even know clearly what they need for land for the what kind of requirements. They don't know. They are asking for the form seven. This is form seven for the foreigners. I'm sorry that you cannot read. I know I cannot translate, but look at it. This is form seven because they want form seven. Form seven is the one that if you hold the form seven, that means that you have right to do the farming on the land. You own this land for farming. This is also part of the form seven. But that doesn't mean that if you own the form seven, that doesn't mean that you can go and do the solar project. And they, this is form eight. For me that actually you have to pay the land lease for, to the government. And this is the land lease form, land tax. This is a form eight. This is the form 105. I just want to show you that for the investors, if you want to bid this project, you have to come across these forms, definitely. Actually 105 is, if the form seven is there, form 105, you can apply for it. This is another form 105 sample. Form 106 is we don't even need for this project, this kind of project. What we need is that once you get the form seven, either you buy it or either you lease it, you have to request that you want to use it, not as a farm lamp, but you want to use it as a solar project. Then you have to apply with a form 14. And how long it takes to get the form 15? This is a form 15. Once you get the form 15, then only you can use this land as a solar project. If you ask me how long it takes, wow, nobody can answer the question. It's a million dollar question. It might take six months, it might take six years, it might take even forever. So what are the advantages for locals? I already told you the land is very complicated. Without local, very difficult for the international investors to work here or to bid the standard. Another advantage for local is because of COVID-19, there's a travel restrictions for overseas travelers. And this is the advantage for us. But for me, I would like to rather see a lot of people bidding for this one so that we can have a very uh, competitive bidding. Another advantage for local is payment are in Myanmar just. So all the investor, they need a good local partners for the repatriation of funds. Thank you very much. I, I would like to, uh, you know, answer together with the other panelists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, KK. And before uh, sharing the questions with other panelists, uh, we still have four questions for you independently. 
So, um, so four questions for you. Uh, number one, uh, as it is a very tight timeline, considering most of the developers are coming in from scratch, is the timeline uh, even realistic? So historically speaking, uh, are there other type of projects approved by all department with the same, um, same, same time frame as this tender? Well, everybody knows that this is a very tight timeline. Everybody knows. And I talked to some of the responsible person and I said that your timeline is too tight. How can we walk? So they said that they have 80 proposals in their office for the solar projects. Now we, the bid is only for 30 projects. So I don't see this is the, the timeline is not very tight. So that's the answer. So when you are saying that uh, historically, are there any other type of projects approved by all the department within the same time frame as a tender? There are so many, so many different cases and different things are there. And I always say the investors that whenever I have a chance to talk in these things, I told them that when you come to the Myanmar and you want to invest, you better remove the one vocabulary from your dictionary. And that dictionary is why. Because a lot of things are, it's not normal in the other country. Let's go to the second question. Uh, the second question is also a little bit sensitive because it's a more um, political related questions. And I know you are uh, maybe one of the most pragmat uh, pragmatic um, speaker uh, in today's webinar. So I, I think you are the only one who can, who dare to answer the number two. So um, how, how, uh, how, how do you think uh, the tender, uh, it, does the tender have any relation with the 2020 election that will be held at the end of the year? Well, I don't think so, because um, if you look back our country, these elections and the, the government, they can change, but uh, those kind of, these kind of projects are basically, it doesn't go in effect. Because we already passed through the last, uh, the changing of the government also, whatever the projects we are doing, you know, it is normally the good thing. One good thing about our government is that once it is set, the next government always honor. So I don't see any impact on the election, uh, because of the election. Sure. Sure. And the, the, the question number three, uh, what is the expected tariff rate from a local developer's point of view? Previously, um, also Mr. Edwin had a brief touch on that point. So what, what might be your idea? Well, you see that uh, if we have enough time, enough time to prepare. For example, you know, I, I, I left Yango last Saturday and I'm still in the one of the up country. I was in the different sites, you know, talking to the different landowners, you know, talking to them. And some of the investors, they bought the land already. But when they bought the land, they're not even thinking about the right of way. And they don't do any survey about the right of way. Because, you know, your land can be far away from the, maybe like uh, six kilometers, seven kilometers away from the uh, substation. Okay, they bought the land. But the story doesn't answer, you know, to make a right of way. And a right of way, you never know, you know, whether these people will agree or not. And the land issues are very, very sensitive here. If the land issue, the government can help us. If the land issue, if we remove the land issue, you see, we can easily, like for me, I can easily bid with less than five cents. Yes. <laughs> Yes, very aggressive. Um, and uh, as, uh, as you mentioned earlier that currently there are around 80 projects waiting in uh, MIC or uh, waiting in uh, the ministry's office. And uh, for this one gigawatt tender, only 30, around 30, roughly 30 projects would be awarded. What about the rest of the projects? They, I, I believe they have been done a, prelimin a preliminary feasibility study and even they uh, have uh, uh, procured or leased a certain piece of land. So oh, does the government have further plan for the additional capacity? Well, Molly, I told you that uh, I was on the road since last Saturday. And yesterday I was on the road and I was so surprised that we have plenty of land 
plenty of land in our country. If you look at the size of our country with Japan, you see our country is the, almost the double size of the Japan land area. We have plenty of land. So if we, the government or the EBGE do it properly, coordinate with the other ministries, coordinate uh, with the chief ministers. You see, I talked to one of the chief ministers. I got a news from the, one of the chief ministers. I didn't talk to him, sorry. Somebody talked and I, I learned from this person. That chief minister wants to lease his land with the very least amount of money because he wants to develop his area. So he's ready to give away the, uh, some kind of, that if you win the, this tender, I will give you the land. And I will lease the land with very small amount of uh, rental fees. But I look back the, the tender documents. If somebody go in with that letter, and I'm sure that that guy will be technically disqualified. Because they, what they're saying is that if there's no Form 7, if there's no Form 8, if there's no 105, 106, you are technically disqualified. So what I would like to see is that there are plenty of projects can be happen in the country. What kind of support we need? We need the inter international investor, developer, and financiers. Make more noise. Make more talk to the you know, government and tell them that do it right. Do it properly. Myanmar people can stay without electricity, but we want to do it properly. We want to do it enough time. Don't go with the emotional, you know, um, uh, how you call it. Uh, don't go the, don't make the decision emotionally. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, passionate, the very passionate speech. Um, I'm almost speechless after hearing uh, what you say, but I totally agree with you that the land is not a uh, one of the uh, is not a big problem for Myanmar, but uh, you need to adopt a right approach to properly uh, handle the land, handle the permits, and handle the government relations. And that's why we need support, especially from the local partners to help us lobby uh, to the government. And that's why we would like to thank you, uh, especially for your kind support in transforming the country's uh, green landscape. Uh, and I think now we can turn our attention to the control panel, to the Q&A box. Uh, currently, there are 16 questions unaddressed in the panel. And I would like to invite uh, Edwin and Peter back in uh, addressing the questions jointly. Uh, I think most of the participants may still have uh, may, may still have certain confusions regarding the tender details. For example, let's start with uh, question number one. Um, will unscheduled curtailment be covered under FM? Who would like to address the question? Edwin? Uh, yes, I guess me. Um, so for, for curtailment, um, it is, yeah, I, I, I don't have the screen now, but um, it, is, um, it is not covered, uh, it is covered under FM. But the FM payments are not sufficient under some circumstances, right? And they actually have provided in something called emergency measures. So they say, look, if we could curtail you because of emergency measures, then that's just the way it is and you're not gonna get paid for that. Um, and one of the emergency measures would be, oh, if we need to safeguard the integrity of the, of, of the electricity transmission system. Uh, so that is maybe understandable, but a little bit vague, uh, and uh, I guess uh, sponsors will, will, will be eager to see uh, the financial rights, the payment rights that they get in, in this situation. That is not specific, that's not very clearly addressed in the, in, in the, in the PPA right now. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is one of these areas where I think that and um, yeah, I, I answered a lot of questions. I thought, I thought I would help out everybody by answering, but then, you know, nobody else gets to answer. So maybe that's unfair, sorry about that. Um, but uh, I think that's one of those areas that uh, are going to be settled in the negotiations. So it's difficult during the bidding phase to come up with a position 
and come up with a, with a low tariff if you don't know the answer to that uh, yet. Yeah, I think this is also further detailed in, in my slides. Uh, I realize, I mean, uh, if there's any people on the call who would like to have the slides, just drop me a line. Uh, or otherwise, I will arrange with uh, with Molly, and then we can uh, we can distribute them. I need to take out a few things uh, before we can send them to everyone. But if you want to have the slides now, you can just send me an email, and then I can uh, I will uh, I will send them over to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. And any comments from KK regarding the curtailment? Sorry. Uh, yes. Any comments from your side regarding the curtailment? Well, uh, I missed it, sorry. <laughs> yes, but for the question number one, uh, will unscheduled curtailment be covered under FM? Uh-huh. Yes, any comments from your side? Uh, no, no, I mean, what Edwin says, uh, you know, I totally uh, agree. <laughs> okay, and let's uh, move to uh, question number two. Uh, is great infrastructure uh, substation evacuation capacity verified I think that's a, um, that that's a, a, that that could be a big question regarding the grid and uh, the, the overall stability uh, when you want to integrate large uh, large share of renewables into the line. Um, so, any comments uh, from Edwin or KK? No, I, I presume they've they've done their job over at EPG. They're, they're usually very good at at these kind of technical things. Uh, but uh, so uh, so I, I think you can in your bid you can assume that uh, that the capacity for the evacuation is uh, something that EPG will take responsibility for. Thank you. Except, except well, of course for the T line that you need to build yourself to the substation. But I mean past past the substation, right? So you you need to build a 33 kV or a 66 kV to get to the substation. But then afterwards, that's that's the end of your of your responsibility. Yes, and the well, they are yeah. 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 sorry, sorry for the interruption. Can you please continue? Oh, in 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 that sense, they already prepare uh, EBG as done a, 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 a lot of study. Well, I've been to one of the substations and there, uh, not even the one project, or for example, like 30 megawatts, which is coming into the switch bay, they have a, a physical slot for even two uh, space, that two, even the two 30 megawatt projects can come into the station. Yes. They have, they have already prepared. Yes. And uh, as Edwin just mentioned that there might be some like new transmission facility, uh, will the cost or even the or even just the maintenance cost be covered by uh, the PPA? Edwin, uh, you, sorry, you're, I was still on mute. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Uh, so uh, the limits uh, on the land. The question of manage, right? Manage. Yeah, you're asking me the question that, that Manish is asking, is there any limit on land per megawatt basis? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's a, an additional Sorry. question to come from our side. Uh, for example, as you just mentioned, that there might be some uh, new transmission facilities uh, built by the developer themselves. So what yeah, the that, cost? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's part of it. Yeah, you have to pay. You have to pay for it, and uh, you 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 rent also the land. I mean, you need to get the right of way for the T line, but you don't need to get that right away uh, during the bid. Um, so th therefore, the uh, but the cost of it you you will need to assume. So you build the T line and you hand it over as soon as it's done. You hand it over to the DPTSC, which mm -hmm. is a part, which is the Department of of. Uh, uh, of uh, transmission uh, of the MOE and, and they will then uh, take charge of this. So the cost for that, uh, which, the, which the sponsor has to pay, you need to recoup that through the tariff. So, that, uh, so it, that, that's why, you know, when we, we, we send our data on the land that we have through our relations, when we send that to the interested uh, bidders, we always try to specify how many kilometer is the land from the substation because obviously there's a cost associated to that mm -hmm. uh, in building that, uh, that T line. So yeah, that's part of the of your bid. I mean, not only the construction cost of the T line, but also the maintenance cost. Will it be covered by the bidders themselves, or would it be covered by the Department of Transmission? 
no, the O and M is done by the DPTSC. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well understood. And uh, yeah, now we can move to the question from Manish. Is there any limit on land on okay. per megawatt basis? Uh, for example, uh, one point five acre per, per megawatt. Hmm. They don't say. Um, so you, 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 in your bid, you need to show that you are technically proficient, so that your project technically works. And wh whatever whatever requirements in terms of land you have with the technology that you are using, this is what you need to show. But they they are not setting out any quantitative uh, uh, requirements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And any comments from KK, our land expert? <laughs> well, uh, there is there is nothing like this uh, in the how you call it in the tender. But uh, if you use some more land, then it will cost you more. So if you be uh, if you can be more effective and you use less land, then your tariff will be more competitive. Okay, and let's move to the next one uh, from Mr. Vinayak. Is it really five hundred thousand US? dollar uh, bid security per project yes really <laughs> yes really really yeah. yeah okay and should one bidder um participates multiple projects at the same time i think that question has already been addressed yes one bidder can participate yeah. in multiple just one, one point may be good to mention in that connection you, you, if you bid on more projects at the same time you need to send in several bids huh? one bid per project yeah, uh, and you and you cannot connect them. That is to say, you cannot say, okay, I will give you uh, four and a half cents tariff, but only if I get five project. Yeah, you, th this you cannot do. They say so. so you have to say, uh, you know, you have to give the tariff per project, and then maybe you end up with only one project. You you don't know that. Yeah, that depends on what the other tariffs are for for that particular township. So this is really just a cluster. Of uh, of thirty tenders rather than one mm -hmm. tender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Understood. And uh, from uh, Sonu, uh, are there any special instructions for foreign EPC companies who wants to support developers in project installation and commissioning? Uh, I, I I think it was Edwin uh, who just mentioned that probably the best way to collaborate with develop developers is to bring finance to bring the financing support and then probably you will have your advantage uh, in this competitive bidding. Uh, am I right, KK? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, um, next um, from um, He Man Shu. Um, how is the open access market in Myanmar? In the worst case, the PPA don't get signed while developer has already constructed the project. I think that's also the question that I want to raise to KK before. There is yeah, always a risk. Actually, uh, you see that uh, according to the, uh, the existing laws, all the state and division government, they can do the, the any power projects, which is less than, less than 30 megawatts, which is not connected to the grid. So if, if they have uh, already, you know, if they don't get the PPA, I mean, they can deal with the, the local government. And then, you know, uh, they can sell the electricity. The chances are there. Well, what do you mean by uh, negotiate with the local government? So that project will become an unsolicited project again, and uh, maybe um, will be in negotiation mode with the, uh, the, the, the local government or the utilities again? No, because uh, this Mr. Sharma is saying that you know, uh, how can they access to the open market? And that's what I'm saying. You know, if you have a power plant in the country, and if your power plant is less than 30 megawatt, you can sell directly to the anybody with the approval of where your power plant is. If your power plant is, say, like one of the division, then you need the approval from the chief minister, and you can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, and any comments from Edwin? Uh, yeah, that's that's correct. Uh, the, the only thing is then you, you cannot use the national grid, so you you would need to do your own um, your own distribution, uh, which mm -hmm. is also allowed uh, even even foreign company. But you could find a distributor, make your own your own mini grid, mm -hmm. 
uh, where, where you are. Um, I, I, I doubt that there's areas where you can do a mini grid for 30 megawatt. I don't think you'll have enough customers for that, but, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I also want to say, um, you know, that we, we, we haven't seen, I, I, I lived there now nine years, it's my ninth year, I haven't seen anybody build something for the government and then it just all fell apart and and they were left with the bill. Um, that hasn't happened. Um, you, you, you can say that they are they are not doing this in the way that other countries are doing and you can say that well, it is weird that the PPA coming in so late and, and things like that. But I don't think we can say that, uh, the, that uh, the government has reneged on, on uh, on, on deals like this and has uh, has left investors in the cold having spent 30 40 50 million dollar and then uh, and 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 then uh, you know reneged on the deal or broke the contract that, that I, I haven't seen so I'm pretty I'm, I'm really confident that you will get to PPA um, uh, um, but uh, yeah, the, they are expecting us to take a leap of faith that uh, some uh, that does not match with the risk profile of a lot of investors. Yeah. Yes, um, and uh, for the next question from Vinayak again, I, I don't think it's a question. Most of the international investors will be setting up a local entity. They will not have three years of revenue meeting the criteria. Uh, uh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the, the answer is yes, and that's why we need more support from local players and from the professional law firms to help us deal with such kind of issue. Mm, no, I, I don't think that that's the answer, Molly. I, I think that you'll need to do the bidding with the foreign uh, parent company that has the revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you have, uh, if you're an international investor, you cannot bid with, with the the, the, the Myanmar mm -hmm. subsidiary that you set up six months ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You will you will have to bid with your uh, top company or or with at least a, a very credible company in your group, and then once you win the project, you'll have to transfer that project to the to a Myanmar subsidiary uh, or a new Myanmar subsidiary. And I don't think that will be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think uh, the, the, the economics behind, the, the logic behind would be they want to take the full control of this project, of the bid. I think the, the problem is that there's been some, um, some uh, blame, some, some comments in relation to what happened in 2016 when uh, certain companies were able to sign up power deals, even though they actually had never done anything in power or haven't done much in power. Um, and uh, so I, I think what they're trying to do is to try to make sure that, that, they, that they have some minimum requirement in terms of the financial substance of the companies that they are, that they are dealing with. And they, they don't want to deal with like, a very very new company just set up for this deal you know and then afterwards nothing happens yeah uh, i don't want to name any names but there are projects you know even solar projects that were signed and that were not done yeah and uh, mm -hmm. so I, I think that's what they are trying to avoid mm -hmm. yeah. thank you so much for a kind of address well understood uh and the next one uh for kk uh from mr chen minko um do you see any relieving of restriction from EPGE regarding the land ownership certificates or MOU or something else? Well, for the, according to this, uh, the documents that they are asking for the Form 7, Form 8, Form 105, Form 106. Actually, if you have a Form 7, it is uh, already good enough, but I already explained that uh, it cannot right away you can transform it to use it as a power plant. And I don't mm -hmm. think they will, uh, how you call it, relieve the restrictions unless all these bidders are, you know, uh, point them about this to them. Mm -hmm. 
Well, can understood. I just add some? Can yeah. I just add something to that, Molly? Um, because this is super fresh. But actually, in the clarification number two, which just went out, I, they, they are actually following what KK is saying because um, they, they actually decided. Uh, they announced that all right, if you don't have 105, don't have 106. You don't have form eight, but by implication, you have form seven. Then that's enough. You don't have to give us 105, 106. You can do that later. Yeah, and uh, so uh, so it, uh, it has been liberalized a little bit. Yeah, m most people, most farmers, actually, when you have a, a Form 7, you don't really need a 105 because you have a map on your Form 7. So you don't really need it. Most, I don't know any farmer who has that, you know. Uh, so then and they're saying, okay, the Form 7 is, is, is enough. On the other hand, for vacant fellow virgin land, uh, somebody asked in the clarification, well, it was actually my client, asked that, uh, uh, look, we don't have a permit for vacant land. We don't have the permission yet, but we applied for the permission. And well, we're being told it's okay, but we don't have a letter of permission yet. Is that enough? Can we just use the application for the permission as, as a land document? And their EPG said, no, that is not enough. You, you need to get that permission letter about the use of vacant fellow virgin land uh, for you to, to, to qualify. Mm -hmm. Well, understood. Thank you so much. And uh, I think, uh, Ms. Chen, you know who you should go to uh, when you have similar questions in future occasions. Uh, and uh, then, uh, Mr. Bissat, uh, if we enter the bid as joint venture or consortium, how the 20 million US turnover is counted? I think that's a question for, for Edwin. So then if you're a consortium, the 20 million applies to the consortium. So that, that means that the, the total of all three or all two should be 20 million. Yeah, you don't have to have 20 million individually. But they do say that the leader of the consortium, every consortium must have a leader, that he needs to have at least 50% of that 20 million. So that means 10 million minimum. Mm -hmm. Well understood. And yeah. uh, next, as we are currently running out of time, um, oh, what, one more compliments to KK uh, for uh, being a passionate speaker and to um, share uh, your ideas so um, uh, freely. Uh, thank you so much for, for the kind sharing. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we, we will need to choose um, three questions from all the following five, uh, all, all the, all the uh, uh, five rest ones. Uh, so one from Mr. Uh, Chirayat. Um, how about opinion from bank about the project financing. Unfortunately today, unfortunately, today we don't have a uh, financier's point of view here, but I would suggest uh, KK to address this question as you have several interaction with the bank already. Well, the, in the local banks, yes. I mean, uh, you see uh, they are interested to do the project financing. The only thing is that in our country, the interest rate is quite high. Mm -hmm. So what, what's your suggestion, probably? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You see, like, the banks are interest, but if you can cope up with the interest, then you, we can talk to the banks. You know, I've already talked to some of the banks, and they are interested to finance. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that when you, the interest rate is can be 10 to 14%, mm -hmm. and the 14% is a calculated as a high risk, mm -hmm. and the 10% is, is a low risk. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, you know, the banks are, when they calculate it, they always end up with a high risk. <laughs> so yeah. if, you can, if you can live with the 14%, yeah, you can get the project financing from the bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's why international money matters in this market at the moment. And uh, I think we are also trying to uh, facilitate the green energy transaction in developing countries. And yeah. there, there could be more support that we can do. Yeah. And uh, um, regional governments, um, I think uh, that's already been addressed. Uh, well, uh, Molly, uh, yeah? that question, you know, I would like to uh, give mm -hmm. the information about it. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, you're saying that uh, any local governments are giving a, a where's the question now? Uh, I just uh, dismissed it. Uh, I'm trying to find it, but you can continue, sorry. Well, I mean, uh, it says that you know uh, any local governments are also supporting. Uh, do regional governments play any role in this standard? What kind of support can the developed 
principles expect from them. In that sense, I want to give information to all of you on this uh, webinar. The McGuire Division, you can go and apply uh, that you want to land. They have a, a, a few land plots and they will give the recommendation to you, these plots are available. And then uh, once you win the project, you can go back to the regional government and then you can have a lease agreement with them. They want to lease out these lands to you. But the point, there are two points are there. This is how the regional government is, you know, helping, which is from the Maguey. But there are two points are there. The first point is that the land that they are offering are, is it suitable or not? That's the investor has to look at it. The second point is that they are asking for the, as I explained in my presentation also, EBG is asking for Form 7. Nothing but the Form 7 that you have to be, uh, you know, consider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. KK. And uh, I think we can come to our... Uh, Molly, yes? can I uh, just... Add on? You know, I, 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 I hate to say it, but... It's, it's, it, it, I just want to say that it's disappointing, isn't it? That, that um, EPG cannot uh, get the regional governments to cooperate with this sooner. I mean, I, I agree with KK, you know, I, I know other chief ministers who also said, yeah, I, I also have, we have 150 here with the, and some land, it's okay, it's with private now, but we would support it. I mean, it's, it's really disappointing. It's really a missed opportunity that EPG did not take the step itself and, and first found lands uh, with these uh, regional governments and then put out the tender saying, look, we have these lands, but you can propose other ones if you have better, that's fine with us, but the tariff will be the tariff. You know, it's, 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 it's disappointing. Yeah. Edwin, now this is Edwin now. I want to hear from you from a long time the saying that I, it is disappointing. Why you are coming out only now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, we will fix it, you know, because actually, like you say, KK, there, there's actually a lot of goodwill with, with the states and regions. And okay, maybe Napido is a little bit harder, but they're, they're, uh, so now we have a little bit more time. I'm a lot more optimistic that actually the states and regions can organize themselves a bit. And, um, and they can also say, well, look, this is land that, that we think is good and you can use it or you can use another one, yeah? Just one disappointing thing about this, very disappointing in the, this is the most important problem that I now have in the clarification number two, yeah? Which, which you know, which just came out. The EPG is saying there that, you know, uh, one landowner can only be in one bid. You cannot have the same land in several bits. And I find, I find that not I, uh, understandable. Um, the same partner, local partner, the same shareholder, yes, of course, I, 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 I understand. You make one bit for one township, you, ca you cannot be you know, doing four different bits with different people, yeah? But, but why not the landowner? Why, why cannot bidder A, bidder B, and bidder C all work with the same land X. Why not? It's not a conflict of interest. Yeah. Uh, as long as the landowner is not a shareholder, uh, then he's just providing the land and probably at the same terms to everybody. That would make it a lot easier for the states and regions to organize this and to 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 allow. Uh, you know, then everybody just needs to find one land everywhere, and we can all use the same land, the best one, or or whatever. Yeah, it would make it a lot easier. So I'm, I'm not sure if EPG thought that through, thought that answer through um, at what it would happen. And we, we, will, we will ask them for another clarification to say that uh, if you are just a lessor, that it, it doesn't matter. But if you are, a, if you are an owner, if you're a partner uh, in the consortium, then yeah, there is a conflict of interest. Yeah, thank you so much for the very exciting uh, um, sharing or address. Uh, this is quite informative. And uh, because uh, I think the land issue and the PPA issue are two of the top barriers or top 
concerns uh, facing all the investors, bidders, developers. Um, I, I would say we choose one question representing one issue from the remaining um, questions. Uh, one from Mr. Uh, Miss Nicole said, under what land usage category the land to be used must be? How long does it usually take for land conversion? Where can we refer to the fees and the charges involved? I think the, the question should go to Kate, uh, should go to Edwin. Duration of the land conversion and uh, what I, might I, be I the think actually problem. both me and Keke can say something about this. Um, look, there, there, there is basically no way how you can get farmland converted in, in uh, I, let me put it this way. I have never ever seen farmland to be converted within six months completely. And you don't have six months because in six months, you need to be ready with the construction. So you need to basically start immediately after the LOA and I've never seen farmland being converted immediately, yeah, like in a week or something. That I, I, I firmly believe that that is simply not uh, possible, yeah. Um, but what is possible is that you find shortcuts, that you find exceptional uh, permissions, exceptional approvals, exceptional uh, um, uh, ex exceptional uh, how to call that uh, ways to go about it. Uh, exceptional approval from the authorities to already start doing some preparatory work, uh, to already start doing some construction work, perhaps, because normally speaking, you're not allowed to lease something until it has been converted. But uh, if you work with, if you work with, uh, if with a lot of support, maybe it's possible to have to have shortcuts and exceptional measures. Yeah, uh, uh, and then it might be uh, possible. Otherwise, the last time I did it, uh, okay, I'm now waiting five five months, and we don't we don't have it yet. Yeah, um, before that, it takes a year, year and a half, six months to to twelve months, uh, something like that. But that being said, in Myanmar, everything's possible. Uh, also, yeah, it's also a country where if suddenly something needs to be done you can you can uh, you can get a lot of support uh, from authorities but i think you should just assume that this can only be done if you are able to get some exceptional shortcuts from the from the authorities and what land it is you also asked that i think in these areas it will almost all be farmland and vacant land uh, vacant fellow virgin land uh, and farmland uh, of the non paddy yeah non petty land, uh, sometimes called garden land. Yeah. So that, that's likely uh, what you will see the most in, in, in these areas. And they would be suitable as long as you get the conversion done or get the permission done. Yes. Uh, let me fill up uh, a, a, a few words here, Molly. Yeah, yeah, sure, please. You see, I've been to one of the, uh, the substation and I talked to the how you call it, the responsible person of the substation. And he told me that the land that the substation was built, the land was bought it in 2011. The substation was built and it was running up to now. This was owned by the, uh, by the you know, uh, the government, uh, EBGE or like that. They not even get the name with the EBGE yet. So you can imagine. <laughs> they knew that they by themselves, they cannot get this land in their name yet. Yeah, absolutely. Quite controversial. Um, I think you could try, actually try one other thing with the land as well. I've, no, I've, I've had some land conversion experience and um, it takes a long time. But one thing you could actually look at is dual use. Um, you know, sort of. You know, fine crops underneath that can be uh, that like shade and sort of you know dual, dual, dual use and everything else uh, uh, is mm -hmm. um, off the top of my head but uh, the, these are the sort of type of innovative ways that I think we have to approach things is try mm -hmm. and do things differently um, because as KK says you got you're dealing with forms this and forms that but uh, you know, let's come in with a new idea and then maybe the, it will be accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Else with the land underneath and put the put and stick the uh, stick the panels higher up. 
Yeah, I, I think Myanmar is a place where miracle happens. So I think we can tr give it a try to every innovative approaches. Yeah. Well, you go for go for it in solo, you know. <laughs> yes, and uh, one last question for today's webinar um, from uh, Mr. Muhammad um, Hasper um, regarding the, um, uh, the, the, the the, the privatization of EPGE. Uh, so what happens to the existing PPA if the EPG is being privatized? Is this a big risk? Any clause in the PPA to accommodate this? Or is there any insurance that can cover the potential risks? Uh, that, yeah, that's, that's not really for me. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't, uh, EPGE, you know, They've tried to privatize YESC, uh, which is the distribution side of it. Um, that, that also doesn't work because you cannot privatize a loss generating enterprise. Yeah. Um, and with uh, EPG, I don't, I don't see this in the next five years to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we have clauses in the PPA that accommodate that, that actually that actually state that this is either a termination event for which EPG has to uh, pay a full amount of the of the uh, of the project, the cost of the project, purchase the project, or uh, the, the PPA will be uh, you know continued under under the same basis. Uh, so it is addressed under under the PPA. Yes, and uh, I saw um, KK. Uh, you are still with us. This, this cannot, Peter. Uh, Edward say that it cannot be happen in the next five years, and I, I don't see this going to be happen. Mm -hmm. And also, like uh, even this happens, as I explained in the very beginning, my experience. You know, I, I've been back in the country for twenty six years. You know, the the always the you know they try to make sure that the contract obligations are you know meet. And this is the one good beauty of our government, all the governments, <laughs> I have to say. Yes, yes, well understood. So in Myanmar, we, we need to understand the culture, the system of Myanmar, uh, and play by their rules. I, I think that's uh, one key mindset that every developers, uh, investors, and financiers should be adapt to. And uh, I think that's... Uh, um, that's the end of our uh, Q&A session. And I'd like to thank you again for uh, Adwin, as well as KK, as well as Peter's participation for uh, contributing to a very lively and intensive conversation. Uh, and I know there are there would be more questions coming up from the audience uh, afterwards. And I would like to recommend you uh, to uh, ask help from ask of ask for help, help from uh, Adam Peter and KK for further instructions or collaborations. And uh, on our side, we'll be sharing the slides by this Friday, but of course, we'll also provide um, further instructions if uh, a part of the slides cannot be shared due to confidentiality. So please stay tuned with us. Uh, and also one last slide. So for our upcoming webinar, uh, because Retalk is a series uh, webinar platform that would accommodate roughly 10 episodes. So for the next episode on air on June the 17th, it will be a floating solar chapter contributed by Master Clean Energy, the UAE giant clean energy investor, uh, IFC, the multinational uh, financier, and the SEMCOP Industries. Uh, one of the largest uh, developers in the Southeast Asia region. So please stay tuned with us and for further questions, we are happy to assist. Thank you so much for today's webinar and for your uh, kind of participation. Uh, this is the end of our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Yeah, bye. bye. bye.